All right. This is a, a, a lecture, of course, that uh, uh, in honor of a, 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 a one of the faculty members here on public policy. Um, I'm going to get to public policy, but it's going to be sort of at the end of the talk because it's my view that uh, policy should be done within the context of a framework that you have some hope of understanding the phenomena that you're interested in addressing before you dictate policy. So the main part of this talk is going to be taking you through our recent history of the U.S. labor market uh, since uh, 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 including the Great Recession and after, as I, as I say, using, as we call it, the lens, all right, of the search and matching model, or the sometimes called the Diamond, Mortens, and Pissarides model, uh, after the uh, three winners of last year's Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, so uh, uh, for the students, I hope, uh, if you haven't been introduced to this uh, model, I'll be teaching you something. And then for uh, everyone, hopefully, uh, it'll uh, provide some insight into our recent uh, history. Um, so there's an introduction. I've sort of given that already. Uh, I want to uh, uh, talk about uh, what uh, has become to known as the worker flows approach, which contrasts with, say, the uh, more standard supply and demand uh, analysis of markets that we all uh, grew up with as uh, undergraduates and graduates. Then talk about uh, how that uh, uh, the worker flows approach is really is about uh, how, what the data looks like that you have to explain, how the search and matching model provides explanations uh, for that uh, data, and then go into its application to the recession and after, and concluding then with some policy implications. All right, uh, the most famous, I suppose, economic uh, statistic other than GMP, gross national product, is the unemployment rate. And what you're looking at here is a graph along the horizontal axis uh, uh, years, uh, covering the last, I guess, 60 years, from 51 to almost today. Uh, and on the horizontal, the percentage of uh, the uh, workforce that are, uh, by the definition of the unemployment rate and the way it's measured, they're looking for a job. They respond to a survey question which says that they've actively uh, uh, looked for a job. Uh, that excludes, uh, there's some broader measures of the unemployment rate, but this is the one that's quoted in the paper all the time. All right. And there's a, a couple of obvious uh, points to make. First of all, it moves around a lot. All right. And it moves around particularly in response to cycles or fluctuations in business activity. All right. The uh, shaded areas are the periods designated by a committee of the National Bureau of Economic Research of what are called recessions. So you, what you see in all those shaded areas are all the recessions since uh, World War II. Uh, a thing to note is that a recession is not necessarily a period of high unemployment. It is, in fact, typically a period of rising unemployment. All right, and recessions typically end at or near the end uh, or, uh, of the rise in unemployment and before uh, uh, an upturn in the economy, which leads to a downturn in unemployment. All right, the dash line is uh, simply sort of the moving average, what the, the thing is fluctuating around. And that's been fluctuating for the last 60 years around, well, 5% or a little bit above, between 55 and 6%. OK. Um, well, here we go. Now, by the flows approach, I want you to understand, let's look at it first from the point of view of supply and demand. From a viewpoint of classical supply and demand approach to markets, unemployment, that is, jobs that go unfilled, are the, and unemployment or its counterpart, unfilled jobs, they arise, they arise only when wages are either too high or too low. All right? That's, uh, think of a standard supply and demand picture. Uh, 
in a supply and demand context, you talk about unemployment, uh, well, if there's an excess supply, there's more people who have to go at the current wage than uh, there are jobs, okay? Um, now, that view of unemployment, which has dominated a lot, many economists thinking for many years, has a slight problem with it. It's basically inconsistent with the model, all right? Because the model says the wages are going to move to equate supply and demand, all right? Uh, so how can you have a model that's supposed to explain what the wage is doing, but, all right? So this is the sort of problem of sometimes called disequilibrium approach. The uh, DMP model is not a disequilibrium model. It's a model that takes the facts as they are. At any point in time, there are both unemployed workers and unfilled jobs. So it's a model that is consistent with the just daily observation that that's true. Uh, and uh, the way that that's rationalized is that there's a matching problem. It takes time for workers to find the right job. It takes time for, to fill jobs with the right workers. There's an there are, these are issues of information. And it's that time that it takes that is an indication or is what we really refer to as the search friction. Uh, the fact that markets, uh, it isn't an issue really of clearing instantaneously, it's an issue of it takes time uh, in the process to do the matching job. Um, in fact, in the real world, there are large flows of workers who find and separate from work all the time both in good times and bad times. This is a, a, a fact uh, about flows. So the way you want to think about unemployment is, all right, it's the outcome of this process. It's the outcome of, on the one hand, the hiring decisions that are being made and the acceptance decision on the part of the workers. On the other hand, the separation decisions that are being made by uh, uh, both firms and workers uh, as they go on to do other things. And these are both flows, and what uh, the level of unemployment is, or its counterpart, the level of unemployment, it's the level of the stock of workers that is continually adjusting to these flows. It's like a, I always tell my students, it's like a bathtub, all right? If more water is going in, going out, the level of the tub is moving up, all right? Conversely, uh, if there's more water going out than in, the level of the tub is going down. And that's the way to think about, uh, 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 in this approach, think about unemployment. It's, and, and what's happening is that stock is continually tending to sort towards some level that balances the flows in and out, all right? And those flows themselves are moving around in shocks in response to various things that are happening to the economy. So that's the difference in viewpoint that uh, this, uh, that this uh, model takes. All right, here's uh, a picture. This is a rather complicated picture, so I'll spend a little time with it. Again, we have time on the vertical, but now it's months. It's every month over the last uh, 10 plus years from December 2000 to April uh, 2000. Well, it's actually beyond April there. I think we're up to July on this picture, July 2011. On the horizontal axis, on the left horizontal, there are two uh, horizontal axes. And that's, I know, confusing unless you're used to graphs. But on the left one measure the, measures the flows in thousands of people. The blue, gra the blue line are uh, new hires, the number of people per month that are hired in each of these months, all right, over the last uh, 10 or so years, almost 11 years, all right. And the red one are the separations, the number of people who separate from jobs. Uh, now, a couple of things to note here. First of all, these numbers are large. In uh, December 2000, five and a half million people were hired into new jobs. And roughly the same number uh, separated from jobs. All right, uh, look down now uh, after the uh, the recession here, again, are in shaded areas, so the, uh, the Great Recession is this large shaded area over here between December 07 and June 09. Uh, at the bottom, at the end of the recession, which is sort of the bottom of the trough, 
the number of uh, people being hired per month is still four million. It isn't that people don't find jobs. They do. They're finding jobs all the time. The difference is simply in the magnitude, all right, of these flows, the relative magnitude. All right, the other point to notice is that we've got another line up here, which is the level of employment, all right? And it's measured on the right-hand axis, so it has a different uh, units. You can see how many people we're talking about. We're talking about 135 million, all right, which is the size of the U.S. labor force, about. Um, uh, all right. And it's going up when hires exceed separations. When the blue line's above the red line, it's going down and vice versa. That's the, lap, that's the bathtub effect I'm talking about. All right, so, this, uh, so it's, it's moving to balance these two flows. Uh, and it peaks right there at the beginning of the recession, and it troughs after the end of the recession. All right? The other thing to notice is that job separations and hires both move up and down together, which looks like rather strange. But the reason for that is separations is composed of two parts, layoffs and voluntary quits. In bad times, layoffs are high, but voluntary quits are very low, and conversely, in good times, a lot of people are moving from job to job. So these things move together. Uh, in a particular way. And that's part of the reason for this large volume during good times, because there's so many people moving from one job to another. Okay, I hope this helps you. It sort of illustrates this notion of flows and that the stocks are just balancing these two flows. Okay, the other concept I wanted to introduce you to is the matching function. Uh, I imagine we've got a lot of economic students out here. Uh, if uh, the matching function is uh, for a market, much like a production function is for, an aggregate production function is for, say, the theory of growth. All right, it's a relationship, postulated relationship, between the rate at which new jobs are formed, all right, that flow I've been talking about, and inputs into the matching process. What are the inputs? Well, the simplest measure of inputs, we can get more complicated, but the simplest measure is how many people are looking for jobs and how many jobs are looking for people. So the inputs are the unemployed workers and the vacancies, uh, and, the and the postulated relationship is that an increase in either of those will increase the job formation rate, all right? Uh, and, uh, and, but that there will be some congestion, that is, if we increase one, hold the other constant, there will be diminishing returns. Then the other postulate is, however, if we double the numbers of both, we'll double the number of new people hired. Okay. Uh, all right. So it has the property of constant returns to scale. It implies something very natural, that the length of time it takes to find a job depends on how many vacancies there are per unemployed worker. The vacancy unemployed, the ratio of vacancies to unemployed, what we call in our lingo market tightness. This would be confusing. In fact, the job finding rate, given this postulated matching function, is an increasing function, job that is how, uh, uh, what's the probability per week of of uh, being matched in the job, a, a typical work when being matched to the ground, is an increasing function of the vacancy unemployment rate. All right, so that's just a postulated. Now what's that, what that's trying to capture, that's trying to capture in a very simple structure this matching process, the fact that it takes time to match workers and employers in a very simple, natural way. The other relationships I've already introduced to you, the, balance, uh, the flow balance relationship, the fact that unemployment tends to the value of the balanced inflows and outflows. If I take these two relationships together, they imply a beverage curve. Now, this is not a spelling error, all right? Beverage is a person's name, uh, actually a, 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 an English lord, who's, uh, and he has uh, his name attached to this particular relationship because he was the author of a study on full employment after World War II in Britain and uh, the concept of a beverage curve, the empirical relationship that we call the beverage curve, which I'm going to show you a little bit later, all right, 
was named for him. All right. Two relationships uh, explain the so-called beverage curve. The beverage curve is an empirical relationship, a negative association between vacancies and unemployment. When vacancies are high relative to unemployment, it doesn't take long to fill jobs, all right? So unemployment's low. When vacancies are low relative to unemployed workers, it takes a long time uh, for, it takes a long time to fill jobs, but it, it takes a short time for, or a long time for workers to find jobs. Unemployment rate's high, all right? Uh, that's implied by these two uh, structures. Uh, just the empirical data, here's the first one, vacancy finding rate uh, on the vertical on the left panel, the vacancy unemployment ratio on the right, and all those dots are monthly observations over the post-war period in the United States. So uh, in log, log deviations, so uh, uh, it's a log linear relationship, uh, uh, which uh, of course is our favorite function in economics, just a power function, right? Or what we would call a Cobb-Douglas in the production function uh, uh, lingo. The right-hand panel is the <coughs> uh, scatter of points for the vacancy rate on the vertical, the unemployment rate on the uh, horizontal, which is implied by the first relationship plus the flow balance equation, and uh, uh, it's uh, in the data. Also a linear, log linear relationship, roughly. Okay, uh, so those, so far what I've described for you, if you like, is the mechanics of the aggregate labor market. It's all, there's no economics there, it postulated a, essentially a technolo technological relationship, and I, post and I defined what is essentially a dynamic equation, who, and I defined the steady state solution of that equation, where flows are inflows and outflows are balanced. So these are purely uh, technical. All right, now comes the economics. Right? The economics are two uh, conditions. One is a demand side condition. Jobs are created up to the point where the marginal vacancy has zero value, i.e., there's no pure profit associated with creating a job opening. Job openings will be created up to the point where those profits will vanish. All right. <coughs> um, per unemployment, all right, with future wage, when, okay. And an implication is, for a given level of expectations, which I'll talk about, is that, uh, of this proposition, is that the higher the promised wages are, I'm gonna emphasize promised wages, this is a dynamic story. Uh, jobs last over a period of time, so both the employer and worker, when they decide to form a match, have to think about what the future wages are going to be. They have to have some expectations about what the future wages are going to be. But when promised wages are high, then profits are relatively low given expectations, so fewer vacancies are created. So it implies a negative relationship between uh, the vacancy unemployment ratio and the wage. The other part, which corresponds, if you like, to the supply curve, is that workers and employers share the surplus value of a match. <coughs> the, uh, it's not a supply and demand model, so their wages don't equate supply and demand. There are always, because it takes time to find a match, there are always match rents available once a match is found. And those rents have to be divided between the two parties. So in the theory, it, uh, we appeal to bargaining theory to resolve that problem, use a simple bargaining model, uh, which uh, implies that uh, the workers and employers share a surplus value, and by implication, the wage demands are higher when it's easier to find a job, because the worker's outside option to employment is looking for a job. Higher that is, the higher the wage they can demand. All right? Um, <coughs> so when the vacancy unemployment ratio is expected to be high, a search equilibrium now is a vacancy, an unemployment ratio, and a wage pair that balances these two forces. All right, what do I mean by that? Well, there's the picture. For a given state of expectations, and I'll talk about expectations later, all right, the higher the wage, the fewer, the higher the wage, the fewer the vacancies per unemployed worker are created. But on the other hand, the higher the vacancy unemployment ratio, the higher the wage demands of the workers. All right, and where those two forces balance, where the red line uh, with the free entry condition 
intersects the bargaining outcome condition is according to this theory where the wage is going to be and where the vacancy unemployment ratio is going to be. All right? So that's the, uh, it's a kind of supply demand, but it's a dynamic story about supply and demand, not a, a static one. All right. Um, just, uh, I'm going to talk about the beverage curve, but just to show over this last 10 periods, this is a picture of measures of vacancies on the left axis, uh, employment on the right. And what it shows, of course, is that as job openings fall, employment's going to follow. As job openings rise, employment's going to rise. That's implied by what I just said. Uh, all right, let's get to, I'll go back to this picture. I should probably shouldn't have this intermediate graph. But now what determines the level of these curves? All right. Well, that's a big story. <laughs> Depends on two very uncertain variables. All right. Because uh, the value uh, of a match is the expected present value for the, uh, looking at the employer side, the value of a vacancy is, well, what kind of profit do I expect to make in the future if I post this vacancy and fill this job with someone? So it's expected present value of the profits that the, that the worker, the employer expects, all right, in the future by employing the, a, a worker now. So there's two issues here. What's the expected stream of future match revenue? Well, there's no market out there by which the employer can go find the answer to that question. All right. What's the expected rate at which the stream is discounted? Well, there's, there is a term structure of interest rates, so there's a bit of, uh, of stuff there, but that's not relevant for this problem. Uh, so the fact that the future is uncertain, and in particular these two components, if I do a calculation of a uh, present value, which you're all business students, you know how to do, well, you don't know how to do it unless you know what that future stream of profits is and what the discount rate is to apply to every future date. All right? And those uh, from our, our, uh, are not uh, quantities that are just readily found uh, in some uh, book or, for that matter, there's no market that gives you the, the answer to that question. So the, the point I'm emphasizing here is the location of that curve is very sensitive to what employers expect about the future. All right. Now, uh, that brings us to the crisis, the financial crisis. Financial crisis adversely affected both of these. All right. What happened? All right. The value of the biggest asset, actually the biggest single capital uh, asset in the country is the value of residential houses. All right, and in, 19, in 2006, that started to tank uh, against everyone's beliefs about whether this could happen or not. Households, once they woke up to what was going on, uh, reacted very naturally. Uh, they said, well, my wealth has fallen. I better start saving, rebuild that wealth. So households uh, reduced consumption expenditure to replenish the wealth. All right, perfectly natural reaction. Uh, to that particular case. Uh, at the same time, of course, there was a big crisis associated with that drop in value, as we all know, in the asset markets. The asset markets had gotten overextended in terms of lent making loans to residential housing and various other things. And there are all sorts of complications having to do with the derivatives, and you've all read about all that stuff. I don't want to go that into that in, uh, in uh, uh, detail. What I want to say is, what's the implication for the labor market? Well, the implication is the bank's restricted lending increased the effective interest rate the borrowers pay. All right? In other words, the rate at which they're going to discount future profits goes up. All right? So for both reasons, the value of a vacancy falls. All right? Severely falls. The expected value of vacancy fell for both reasons. Okay? So what does that do in the picture? It shifts. The green line down to the purple line. Northwestern's purple, but I'd never thought about you know, that fact. Uh, <laughs> and what are the, what's the consequence? Well, there's two consequences, really. There's pressure on wages to fall, all right? Because now the value of, uh, of searching for a job has fallen, all right? If the vacancy unemployment ratio has fallen, so is the value. So, uh, and the vacancy unemployment ratio falls. Vacancies fall relative to unemployment. As a consequence of their falling relative to unemployment, 
wages come down. But wages don't come down enough to compensate. Totally. That curve would have to be flat. I'm sorry, the other way around. The curve would have to be vertical to fully compensate. And it's not. In fact, we're not even sure what it is, but it's, uh, it's pretty flat. All right? That's uh, the best we can say empirically. All right. So uh, you get this drop in the vacancy unemployment rate. What does that mean for the, uh, in terms of the beverage curve? This is the beverage curve in all its glory. Uh, I put it up here uh, for a very good reason, because it, it really maps out what happened in the labor market over the last uh, 10 years. The blue points up there, these are uh, monthly observations. It's the same data as we saw earlier, but just in a different form. Blue observations are the uh, uh, 2001 recession. And you move down the beverage curve in response to the kind of thing I'm just talking about. Uh, then uh, the red down to November or so, uh, 2001, uh, and a little bit further down. Then the recovery is the red dots, the connected red dots. And you move back up the beverage curve all right, as the vacancy unemployment ratio rises. What's on the, or I should say, what's on the axis, uh, the, jo the vacancy rates on the horizontal, unemployment's on the, uh, on the horizontal, I'm sorry, vacancy's on the vertical, unemployment's on the horizontal. The vacancy unemployment rate is, take a point out there, any point you want, it's the slope of the line from the origin to that point, right? So when the vacancy unemployment ratio is high, Unemployment's very low, all right, as we just said. And then, of course, the recession of 2001, vacancy unemployment rate falls, unemployment rises, uh, all right. Then there's a recovery, which are the red lines. And that brings us to December 07. December 07, the uh, uh, housing market starts to get weak. There's some rumblings in the financial markets, not yet a crisis. So, but from December 2008 to uh, the famous year, uh, month, September 08, which isn't marked, but it's sort of down there at the bottom of the red lines, but it's in the green line. Then from there on, we just really tank down, or really march down the beverage curve from uh, 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 the, uh, September 08 to June 09. Uh, June 09 is picked here because it's the official or NBR end of the recession. All right, and after the recession is that little squiggly green, blue stuff, All right? Um, that's where we've been sitting for uh, almost, well, oh, for over two years now, All right? Up to, Ju and the data here is up to July uh, uh, 2011. So what happens is vacancies go up a bit in what was supposed to be recovery. Unemployment doesn't respond very much, but does later respond a bit, and that's, uh, that latter response is uh, what I want to talk about now. All right, hopefully you understand what happened in the recession. Now let's talk about after the recession. Because there's been a lot of debate about that. Just to uh, characterize the nature of the debate, uh, I pick a couple of quotes. One is from Narayana Kukler-Lakova, uh, Kukler-Lakova, <laughs> who is a very well-respected economic theorist, um, who also happens at the moment to be the president of the Minneapolis Fed Reserve Bank, all right? And he made this statement over a year ago, what does this change in the relationship between job openings and unemployment connote? And he's referring there to, all right, this vertical movement up in the blue uh, dots. In a word, mismatch. All right. I think he says uh, further on the quote, you can't convert construction workers to manufacturing workers overnight. All right. I think he could have done much better than that. You can't convert construction workers to healthcare workers where the job is overnight. He would have made a better point uh, because that's where the job growth has been in the last two years. Okay, so that's his view. It's just, there's a mismatch. The, 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 what that means is the jobs that are out there don't match the qualifications of the workers that are out there. Okay, so that's one view. 
I'm going to talk about that quite a bit. The other side, uh, well represented by Christine Romer, who, as you know, was uh, President Obama's uh, first uh, 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 chair of the uh, Council of Economic Advisors. In last April, uh, she says, instead, the elevated unemployment rate appears to reflect mainly cyclical factors, particularly the lingering shortfall of consumption spending and business investment. No doubt, consumption spending has not gone up. All right, investment has gone up very little. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that's the other argument. I just put in a third vote here because uh, Marty uh, Feldstein was Reagan's uh, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors way back there. And he actually sides with Christina, although he's very Republican, if you uh, know him. You know. The high unemployment rate reflects the lack of demand rather than fundamental problems of the US labor market. All right. Now, I happen to agree with Marty. All right, so that's my position as well. Let's uh, see what the evidence says. Okay, so what's the arguments for mismatch? Well, one simple argument is the beverage curve has shifted out, reflecting the possible fact that it may have become harder to match workers with jobs. That is, it now takes more vacancies per unemployed worker to match, to get a particular matching rate. That's what the statement's saying. And that's what, if you like, that's what this picture kind of says. All right, it takes more vacancies per unemployed worker all right, to get a particular unemployment rate. All right, and uh, so that's a simple-minded view of what the picture says. And that's really what uh, Kotlikova was referring to. All right, uh, we already went through that. Of course, we know construction and finance industries were adversely affected. Employment fell. Uh, about 1.3 million in these sectors, and most new jobs are in health services, so uh, there's some reasons. Another argument that's pointed out, that's stated, is that uh, the labor market typically is a very fluid, well, uh, households are rel have in the past been relatively quick to move uh, across regions in response to differential, regional differentials in uh, job availability. All right, one of the important sort of uh, uh, adjustment mechanisms in the, in the labor market is the willingness of people, in fact, to move where the jobs are. And uh, uh, that's been complicated, that process has been complicated by, again, you know, the housing market problems because people are locked in. The housing market lock, 11 million mortgages underwater, uh, is, you know, it's hard to walk away and leave and go to another region. So it's reduced inter-regional uh, mobility, another argument that for uh, structural issues. And finally, a third argument, I'm you know, now giving a list besides the pure mismatch argument. Uh, ex uh, unemployment benefits were extended roughly from 26 to 52 weeks. Uh, and that reduces worker search effort, incentive worker search. In fact, some of my early papers were about that, all right? And uh, that argument's had a big effect on discussing the role of unemployment benefits um, in uh, the labor market. So there's, there you go, uh, three possible uh, contributing factors to uh, support the argument for mismatch. Um, so uh, I've been trying to do my homework. Uh, I haven't had time, much time for research myself, all right? but try to see what other people have been doing in terms of trying to, uh, trying to answer whether or not these are, these are valid reasons. And if you just sort of take the first one, uh, you just take the theory itself. That's what my former colleague, uh, uh, Gaudi Barlevi, did. Uh, take the theory itself, uh, it implies, well, if it does become harder to um, match workers, the beverage curve will shift out, just as we saw. But then there's another effect, there's an incentive effect. If it's harder to match workers, then the uh, value of a vacancy has to be higher in order to compensate for the cost of finding those workers. And that's going to have another uh, uh, effect on the vacancy unemployment ratio. It's going gonna, it's gonna to reduce it even more, all right? So if you actually take the theory 
the model and you take the data and you use the data to estimate these effects, all right, uh, 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 the parameters of the model, uh, which Bar-Levy did, he comes up with an estimate of the effect of, uh, uh, of uh, mismatches at about 1.5 percentage points. All right, now the unemployment rate, if you looked at the pictures, increased from 5 percentage points to 10 percentage points. So it's only one point, so he comes up with this maybe 1.5, actually maybe two percentage points, uh, could be explained by uh, just that shift in the beverage curve. A more uh, nuanced analysis, which actually looked at data, <laughs> surprise, surprise, more data, um, they, they really went to, to look to see what was the extent of mismatch across industries. Um, and you can do that, one of the measures of that is, did dispersion and unemployment increase over across industries? And using that data, uh, uh, Vellante and his co-authors come up with an estimate about point, plus 0.8 to 1.4, all right? Then an even more recent uh, study by uh, some of the staff members of San Francisco Fed, uh, 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 in a paper, well, it's now, uh, it's now been published in the San Francisco Fed's uh, bulletin, whatever it is, but it, I uh, found it in, it just was a, uh, a working paper. They used historical data to estimate the response of the job creation to shifts in the, quote, natural rate. Uh, also considered effects of extending UI benefits. Um, I, they did a quite good job of looking at a lot of different data, and I could give you many, many pictures from their paper, but I'll refer it to you since uh, I'm giving you a lot of pictures already. <laughs> but they find uh, uh, mismatch could account for, their estimate is lower, maybe uh, eight-tenths of one percentage point, but they also will add another six-tenths of a percent for extending unemployment benefits. So that brings it up to 1.4, 1.5. So all of these estimates are in this more or less the same ballpark. Okay, so there may be uh, a fact, but doesn't explain the total story, right? Doesn't explain the five percentage points difference between, or four percent, I'll say it's four percent now, between nine percent and five percent, which was the uh, historical average, as I showed you at the beginning. All right. Uh, just to, I uh, will show one of the pictures because unemployment, extended unemployment benefits have been uh, batted around politically and in the press as a major reason for uh, the increased unemployment. Uh, here's a natural experiment, data natural experiment. Uh, it's actually measuring the average duration it takes to find a job. That's the horizontal axis in weeks, all right, on average, for two groups of people. Uh, job losers, those who are UI eligible, and uh, quits and new entrants who are not UI eligible. All right, so just comparing those two, two groups. As you see, for both groups, duration goes up. All right, and, uh, duration in weeks more than doubles for both groups. All right, there, there's a little bit of evidence that maybe went up a little bit more for, uh, that's the red line for uh, UI eligibles during the recession, and then sort of typed, the, typed up, all right? But uh, the increase in duration is not due to extended UI benefits, right? All right, there's something else going on. It affects both groups. Uh, the differential effect, there may be a small differential effect there, and that's what these authors measure as the 0.6 percentage point uh, 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 attribution to extended UI benefits. Uh, there, there, there's good theory. You can do an estimate here based on, histor on, on uh, micro data uh, because there's, there's a ton, a raft of studies on the effect of UI benefits on duration from in every country. I think I've seen it in at least in every country that has data on duration. All right? And all of them uh, measure an effect of more generous benefits, longer benefit period, higher. All right, and you can take those estimates and come up with a measure of what the effect is in this particular case. And it's larger than 0.6, all right? But 
there's a problem. Those, all of those studies are basically, you can collect them together, normal periods in the labor market, not periods in which it's very hard to find a job. All right? When it's very hard to find a job, the disincentive effects of UI all right, are large, are, are small, rather. The marginal disincentive, there's not, you know, job search itself has a, during times when there are not many jobs out there, uh, there are a lot of people who get discouraged no matter what. The marginal contribution of extended benefits is not going to, you know, you can argue it's not going to extend things much. But extended benefits are very important for the welfare of the households. All right. It's an income, that's why it was invented. It's an income support system. So uh, it's an insurance system. And you need insurance when? When you have catastrophes, like uh, when the duration goes up, doubles. Duration of unemployment doubles. All right. So uh, what about deficient demand? Well, we know that households are either credit constrained or choose to reduce debt rather than buy current goods and services. There's no doubt about it. You all have to do is go out and look at the, what the consumption numbers are. All right? Consumption tanked and hasn't you know, gone up. Uh, now, what, uh, what that really means, think about it in terms of economics, what the households are doing, they say they want to save more. What does that mean? They want to, they're expressing a desire to substitute future goods for current goods. All right, that's what they want to do, substitute future goods for current goods. Now, uh, there's an imbalance in the goods market when that happens. What's the price is supposed to equate it? Basically, the interest rate. All right, and that's the argument for expansion mo expansive monetary policy. Drive the interest rate down and reduce the incentive that households have to substitute future goods for current goods. Um, there's a... Uh, as that interest rate falls, of course, what's supposed to happen? Well, uh, one should anticipate that future demand for, for goods. And in anticipation of that, there should be an investment boom going on. Right? You should be providing the means by which you can supply those future goods. And a lowering interest rate is supposed to give you the incentive to do that. That's not what's happening. All right. Uh, there are there's a segment. Small businesses are still uh, credit constrained. It's very hard for a small business to get a loan to start a business. Virtually impossible. Now, large businesses don't need that source. They can go to the bonds market, and of course, we all know what bonds yield fell uh, this last week by uh, several uh, hundred basis points. Uh, and uh, large corporations uh, have access to that. What are large corporations doing? They're accumulating $2 trillion worth of cash and basically spending it, some of it, by increasing their dividends. They're not buying equipment. They're not doing... Uh, so what's happening? Well, uh, it really suggests that expectations about future prospects remain depressed on the employer side. That is, the employers don't know when the future demand is going to arrive. There's no futures market to tell them. All right? Uh, and so there's uncertainty. Now, I, my argument, it's uncertainty about when future demand is going to recover. All right? Number one, I also go with Bob Hall. Interest rate can't fall enough. We probably need a negative interest rate to bring supply and demand into balance. That can't happen because nominal rates are at zero. Uh, so it's my argument. Now, there are counter arguments. Actually, we've seen this in the political discussion. Uh, what about you know, future taxes and regulations? There's all sorts of uncertainty about future taxes and, and regulation. Now, I wanted to find some reputable economist to attribute this to. And my very, very good friend, personal friend, Bob Lucas, accommodated in a Wall Street Journal piece that, a week or so ago. Um, by at least suggesting uh, this particular reason for the problem, that uh, employers are, uh, are uncertain about future tax rises and regulation. Uh, and there was a response to that. Uh, and the, EP, the Enterprise 
you know, EPI, which is, a, I'll admit, a relatively left-wing research group, but uh, responded to this by showing the response showing the, the responses to the survey of small businesses on ex exactly this point. I think the question is, what's the single most important problem all right, for your business today? And this data is organized by uh, presidential term. Uh, and uh, uh, as you'll see, uh, poor sales is their problem. Uh, some uh, increase relative to the Bush period in concern about taxes and regulation but the big movement is in uh, their reporting their lack of, of sales. Um, okay, uh, so to summarize where I think the evidence is, all right, we start off with the, uh, that's the empirical job creation curve intersecting the beverage curve at this point B, all right. The beverage curve moves out, the, uh, the uh, job creation curve shifts to the right, uh, a vertical distance, which is the shift uh, uh, in uh, uh, that you see in the green line, all right? Uh, and that accounts for part of the difference. The remaining difference is uh, uh, insufficient demand, and there was an adjustment. Uh, the, which this, this picture starts with November 10, so there's a one-point adjustment from 10 to 1 which was off the new beverage curve, according to the analysis. All right, so that's sort of the relative contributions of the various components. So mismatch may have some role, but certainly is not the majority role, according to, the, to this analysis. All right, this brings us to government policy. About time. <laughs> All right, but uh, let me uh, uh, simply quote uh, another friend of mine, Bob Hall, current, uh, well, was, this is a presidential address of almost a year ago, 2010, where he sort of summarized the policy problem is monetary policy has gone to the limit, pushing the interest rate down. Can't push the interest rate down any further. Can't get the nominal interest rate below uh, uh, half a point to the banks or, and, of course, the, uh, the uh, Treasury bill rate, what's now to 1.7. Um, they're, of course, trying to do the twist, so it would have more impact, and they tried that earlier with QE, the QE1 and QE2, trying to affect long-term rates as well. Uh, and uh, the problem with monetary policy and long-term rates is that it's just not a very effective tool, right? The Fed can affect short rates, but has very little effect on the long, long rates. So that's what he means by push to the limit. Uh, and his other point is, well, what, it, what else you do? All right, well, pretty obvious what else you could do. Uh, private demand has fallen, both consumption demand, investment demand. You need to compensate by an increase in demand. How do you do that? Well, at 1.7, I would say there's plenty of investment projects out there, public good investment projects, that any of us would be willing to make investment in. All right. In fact, we would even might collectively agree all right, to increase our taxes to do it. I don't know about you, but I find Chicago pot potholes absolutely disgusting, particularly if you have a, uh, my wife does, so I blame on her, an MBA, a, a European car that's designed for European roads that don't have potholes. They don't. They, driven in Europe, they don't have potholes. All right, uh, there's one thing, all right. All of our bridges are falling down, all right. Half of our schools are falling down, all right. Uh, investment in education, uh, we need. Uh, I didn't talk about long-term mismatch problems. There are some long-term mismatch problems I could talk about, all right. So there's plenty of things, particularly at it, this kind of interest rate, that we can invest in. But, to use Hall's comments, the government seems to lack the logistic tools to expand government expenditures significantly, and the political wind is blowing in the wrong direction to push that lever very hard. I would say that's an understatement, right, about what's going on politically. So, in conclusion, some mismatch exists, perhaps 
25% of the 4% or 1% one one or more percentage points out of the 4% increase. Uh, and there's a future problem, I should say, about mis uh, 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 concerning the effects of long-term uh, unemployment. We know from experiences in Europe in the 80s that uh, long periods of unemployment is very, de well, you just, workers lose their attachment to the labor force, uh, so they lose skills in the broad sense, all right? And uh, that comes back to haunt you later. Uh, the real problem now is consumer demand for goods and services uh, has not and is not expected to recover soon. That's the, I'm interpreting what employers are doing as uh, their expectations about recovery. Uh, fiscal stimulus would help, but not likely to pass Congress because we're focusing on another real problem, but it is a long-term issue. Uh, the jobs problem is a short-term problem, and if we could fix it, we'd go halfway to solving all right, the deficit problem uh, in and of itself. All right, so uh, I'm, I guess, uh, going to throw me uh, out uh, by saying a Stiglitz supporter at this point, all right? The only problem with Obama's job bill is that it's too small, all right? Uh, it needs to be twice as large to probably to have much uh, effect. Uh, that's it. Do we have, uh, I'm subjecting myself to questions. <laughs> Thank you all. Okay, uh, let's take a few questions. Don't be shy. Thanks. Um, what do you think um, with the excess of uh, um, unemployment will have on the future of uh, housing prices? Or what's your personal thoughts on that? Do you think they're, they're going to stabilize sooner than later? Or do you think it'll take some more time? I mean, I, of course, we're, it's going to take like five plus years before we see well, real appreciation. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the housing market, and, you know, they're not, as I suggested, they're not, a, they're not separate housing and labor markets here. Um, by any stretch of the mind, very, very interactive. The problem with the housing market at the moment is that we overbuilt, all right, and people are overly in debt, all right. I've been trying to sell a house for a year, over a year and a half. It's a house that's not at the very top of the market, but it's a second house, all right. It would be the second, not the first house you'd buy as a young person, but the second one you'd buy. Uh, now, very much like the analogous to the labor market, usually, all right, in a robust housing market, there are many people in that segment because they've bought their first house, they've uh, acquired appropriate equity in that house, all right? So those are your buyers for the second house, my house. They're not there, all right? They're, uh, they can't get rid of it. They're underwater. They can't sell their house. They don't have any equity. So here I'm stuck with, you know, an unsold house. How far should I drop the price? Yeah, well, that's a good point. Rent it instead. Uh, there, you know, there are some major frictions in the housing market, too, when it comes to renting. I'm not, all right, an expert on renting. Uh, those people who are are doing very well. Rents are going up. They're going up very steeply in a lot of places. So that response is happening, renting, all right? And it's an option, but it's not a good option for me. Right. Anyway, so that's going to happen. So, so long as the uh, households view themselves as overly indebted, they're going to continue to save. So that, that's going to keep the demand for, uh, uh, household demand for goods and services low. All right. Professor, um, do you, uh, Two related questions. Here I'm oh, here Two related questions. What would you like to see the so-called super committee do, and what do you think they will do? Uh, well, uh, well I'd say, go home. <laughs> <laughs> and they probably will. 
<laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, was, uh, the best they can do is or, the best they can do is not create another, you know, political hoopla. They're not going to solve the problem one way or the other. So, All right. I, my, I think my answer is, is appropriate. Go home. Uh, I've uh, I never heard the term jobless recovery until about 1990, the 91 recession, yeah. and 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 not too long ago I saw some charts based on uh, micro data and, uh, on firm side. Yeah, it's, it's, too. Oh, the, like, well, it seems to suggest that at least since we've been uh, since we've been collecting data, yeah. that the the rate of job creation or the the rate of firm births. Uh, seem to slow relative to the increase in firm deaths. And I wondered if, if the employment data was, was consistent with that. We're not creating enough jobs. Yeah, well, th there's two trends that need some explanations that we don't have a good explanation from. These flows I was giving you on job uh, uh, hires and separations, they, those, the levels of those flows have actually declined over the last 20 years. So there's less, uh, the, the, the labor market is still very dynamic, but less dynamic in that sense. Uh, uh, the uh, term uh, uh, jobless recession was coined in the 90s, but 2001 it was worse, and this time it's even worse. So there, there are these secular um, changes in the labor market that beg to be explained. And I don't have a good explanation for them. I mean, I can show you where the problems are, but just why. There's you know, various uh, speculation. One is the change in composi industry composition. All right. I mean, it's not unrelated to what's also known as the Great Moderation until the last recession. You know that the that the that the uh, magnitude of the of the uh, cycles was smaller. Um, that the change in composition of uh, the economy away from manufacturing towards services uh, may be partly the culprit. The, uh, the matching issues are different uh, in a more service-oriented economy. Uh, but I haven't seen any good research on that point. It's, it's, it's conjecture at this point. A uh, double dip, of course, is a boogeyman that the papers like to use. I mean, what's the difference between a, a 0.01 rate of growth and a negative 0.01 rate of growth, which the newspapers would make a big deal out of it, but in fact, you know. Uh, I don't know. There's no particular reason why things should get much worse, <laughs> which is maybe the good news. That's the good news. Right? But there's not much reason to think that things are going to get better very fast. I mean, that's, that's the best way to characterize it. Yeah. Professor, you indicated earlier that in countries uh, where the unemployment insurance uh, benefits are more generous, mm -hmm. they have higher duration of unemployment. Mm -hmm. uh, following on that, uh, in the United States where we have trade adjustment assistance, which I, I believe that is still important. We did have trade adjustment uh, assistance. We, that, that program's not. The program was designed in the 70s to retrain manufacturing workers. We don't, hardly don't have any anymore. But go ahead. No, no, well, for, for anyone who's lost their, uh, their job for trade-related reasons, yeah. um, what, what is your impression about the effects of trade adjustment assistance? Uh, does that uh, also uh, create the duration, of, uh, increase the duration of unemployment? And do you think it has any, ever had any positive effect on it? Well, uh, the... the uh, Unfor the research on retraining workers has never been uh, one full of positive results, let me put it that way. Um, but it goes on all the time. I mean, I, I don't know whether it's the methodology of the research or, or, or what. Uh, workers get themselves retrained, uh, and that's happening now. Uh, there, are, there are many people going back to school, moving toward the, the health industry. Uh, so now, what the impact of the of that of that particular I mean, that was a program designed to 
to uh, uh, deal with the question, you know, there are winners and there are losers uh, associated with, with opening up to international trade. And the winners ought to be helping the losers, all right? And that was the rationale for that program uh, when it started. Uh, now, as I, I don't know his, uh, uh, detailed history of the program, but I think it's sort of lost more and more of its uh, effect simply because it was focused at specific manufacturing uh, industries and now the job loss is, is, is more, is beyond that. You know, it's not, we're not just talking about manufacturing. Right. Yeah. Um, what do you, what do you what are your opinions on the possibility of U.S. goods finding better sales in, in the international market in light of the kind of disputes that have been happening around these accusations that China's uh, artificially suppressing the value of the Iran? Well, uh, I think it's a political excuse, frankly. Um, uh, this is a business school. Get out there and sell those goods and services, guys. You know, we're doing a pretty terrible job of it. All right? Uh, I think we need to be a little bit more aggressive on the, uh, in the business side of things. Yeah, it, arguably, the, you know, it's overvalued. Uh, um, will, how much difference it would make if you change the relative value by 20%? Well, it would help manufacturing. It wouldn't solve the problem. Because if, if we could double manufacturing employment and we would hardly make a dent in the unemployment rate numbers. And it's only 6% now. <laughs> What are some specific uh, policy changes you can see uh, and kind of make an impact on demand? Uh, the only one I can see is that we go out there and like this. Now, I know. Yes, did, I, did I say education? Policy changes require education. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there are a lot of good causes. And the problem with input, there are, there's always a problem of implementation uh, and also financing. But uh, the point I was making was that any businessman worth his salt if it, all right, if you can borrow money at a couple percentage points, I can think of a lot of investments out there that would be worth making in the long run. That's my basic point. Uh, uh, I'm not, I'm an economist, all right, not a policy design person, all right. Uh, now, the, what policies you would follow is pretty obvious, all right. Government would have to do it. You might come up with something brighter, right? Uh, like there are ways to, I mean, one of the issues with financing, say, a new highway is it's government debt. We don't like government debt, right? Well, why don't we make it private debt? Why don't we get imaginative and uh, make the financing of a new road private? We, we know how to do that. It's called a toll road, you know? So where do you see the unemployment and the um, job openings sector in the next one to two years? Do you think anything's going to change? Or if the government can implement policies that will alter those markets, what's going to happen in the next one to two years? Yeah, well, uh, what I, I've already sort of suggested that under the current policy regime, uh, uh, we're just going to be making a very slow recovery, all right? Uh, so unless, the, uh, uh, unless there were a major move on the fiscal front, which I don't expect to happen, all right, the aggregate unemployment rate's going to slowly fall. Now, there are sectors, of course, where there's significant job growth. Uh, so if you happen to be in those sectors, if you're going to go into the health uh, services industry, uh, that's where the action is at the moment. In the labor market. 